And welcome everybody to the Daily Space Weather, bringing you some wavelengths we don't normally show today on the Daily Space Weather Show. Congratulations on realizing the channel exists. I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash. That's the past 24 hours from SDO, showing 211 angstroms running difference of 60 minutes with 305 ang 335 angstroms. You may see some activity right in this area down here. That is a significant CME that happened. It started ejecting just before midnight. And there was definitely some ejecta, which we will get to momentarily. First, here are today's frames from SDO Continuum. A modest uptick in sunspot number since yesterday. Here's SDO Magnetogram for today, January 5th, 2023. Also, we've got the Ask a Particle Physicist segment coming at you today. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We'll be talking about a claim regularly heard on YouTube, whether or not solar flares cause earthquakes. Yeah, it's coming. So next we'll cover volcanoes. And there's a map of the erupting caldera around planet Earth. Here's a new one that's on the list. It's Gamma Lama. There it is from a webcam. It's doing some outgassing as we speak. And here comes the list. There have been some earthquakes once again occurring underneath the Rakyanis Peninsula. So there's the list. I'm not going to read off every volcano. It's, I just know. It's not doing it. But that's what's erupting. There it is scrolling across the screen for your convenience. And let's talk earthquakes next. So first, the there's the 90-day bar graph. And only two five or greater magnitude quakes have occurred in the past 24 hours. Although several in Alaska and one four-plus magnitude quake in California. So the five and greaters include this one near the Indian Antarctic Ridge there south of Australia. That 5.2 at 3.16 universal time this morning. And then no five magnitude quakes until a 5.2 strikes Japan at 2026 this evening. And that is where the earthquake coverage ends. Here is where the Ask a Particle Physicist segment begins. So once again, we're bringing you a video made by Eugene the Philosopher. So without further ado, take it away, Eugene. Hello, so today's question is in light of the unfounded claims made on YouTube since the recent 7.4 earthquake in Japan, do solar flares cause earthquakes and if so, how? Well, first of all, I don't think they do. However, like, uh, I don't think there is any significant correlation, all right? So, yes, like there was a mm, coincidence, let's say, of this earthquake. You see, it's uh, January 1st, uh, 10 UTC, and the flare was what? Uh, December 30, 31st. Basically, like 12 hours difference, right? So it looks very suspicious. But then again, if you look at the, the second strongest flare of this cycle, uh, you don't really see any quakes there, any significant quakes, right? So let, let's show, actually look at this. Uh, 14th of December, right? So here I have last uh, 30 days. Let's sort by date. So December 14th, do we find anything here? Let's, let's try, let's try. anything significant so the flare occurred at 17 so right around that time there was a flare and you can only see like minor five four four we were already like a whole day past that two days past that etc et so <laughs> You can only like look at this anecdotal sort of evidence, sure, firstly, and second, it's my own opinion, okay, you might have a different one. Uh, or you may actually find, 
even like a pretty high correlation, you know, with good p-value, like statistical significance and crap like that, it's really easy to do the p-hacking, right, so-called. Uh, but then again, wh what's it gonna do to you? Like, if you see a flare today, can you s say for sure, like, you know, in three days there's gonna be a quake? No, you can't. So what are we even talking about? You know, like I have a, and I'm kind of like skeptical, even on the, on the bitter side, <laughs> about this because I, I've actually spent a lot of time trying to find, you know, any sort of correlations of this sort. Like I've I've studied various like even shady topics like the solar sector boundary crossing correlation to earthquakes, like all kinds of crap, like heliospheric uh, current uh, sheet tilt with respect to earthquakes, like etc, etc, so yeah. But, uh, if we are playing devil's advocate, let's assume the flares do cause earthquakes, what could be the possible physical mechanism? And I think it's the ionization of the atmosphere, I mean, what what is the flare doing to like the surface of the earth? pretty much nothing, right? It, it penetrates the magnetosphere, like magnetosphere is transparent to, to solar light, including X-ray and UV and gamma and whatnot. So it's it's just gonna like ionize the atmosphere, so you'll have more charged particles, slightly stronger currents in the atmosphere. Uh, therefore, there will be inductive currents in the Earth, so maybe telluric currents would increase, you know, the currents that run through the, surf, uh, the Earth's crust. And maybe that would provoke some sort of response, all right? And there is a paper which th like uh, supposes exactly this mechanism. Here they claim, like, yeah, we have a really good correlation. But then again, I, I already told you it's, it's garbage most of the time. But this is my opinion. Like, of course, they sound very convincing. So they say that uh, I haven't checked their numerical estimations, as they call them. But they say that the telluric currents from a strong flare would be comparable to those that have been used for uh, artificially induced quakes, uh, that is induced by currents actually. So they've, uh, in the 90s, you can see, they've uh, buried like wires of current with, with current, basically just buried wires and uh, sent like a pulsed direct current through them and they they managed to induce like uh, some minor quakes okay so and according to their estimates i repeat i did not check them uh, this is consistent with the uh, telluric current increase from the strong solar flare whether you want to believe them or not whether you are you know a solar flare kind of enthusiast like uh, it's your choice once more, like I would encourage any good research into this topic. It's just that um, uh, I just don't have the resources, neither time nor energy to do it myself. Otherwise, sure, I mean, why not? It's a, it's a pretty good area because, again, it has a pretty big societal impact, etc., etc. So uh, be my guest, but my short answer is probably not, okay? They probably don't influence the earthquakes. So there you go. That's our Ask a Particle Physicist segment of the week. We air them every Friday. If you want to contribute yourself, visit us over at smashomash.com slash forum. It's entirely free. You can submit your own questions to the Ask a Particle Physicist segment, but most importantly, make sure you subscribe to Eugene's channel. So Eugene's blowing up, so get in there on the ground level. Go check out Eugene the Philosopher and press the subscribe button. Go watch all of his content. Tell your friends and foes about the channel. And cheers. Thanks again to Eugene. He is the top contributor to this channel. And let's get to some more space weather facts here. We're going to take a look at some more imagery of the closest star. There's a 24-hour video for you in the classic house favorite wavelength 171 angstroms. A great view of some significant sunspots as well as a CME popping off right at the beginning of the movie there. Wait till it reset. There you go. There it goes. Oh, and it's off. Is it headed this way? Don't worry. We will cover it. Before we do that, there's a full disk view as well to show the polar regions, which are pretty quiet here at the moment. 
and let's get into some more space weather data. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux has moved up quite a bit to 153 solar flux units. 153 is the new 10.7 centimeter radio flux number, otherwise known as the F107. There you go. 153 it will be at the next update. And there's a space weather enthusiast dashboard. NOAA's not forecasting any geomagnetic storms or geomagnetic unrest. And next we'll move to Earth's magnetic moment from space. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So this is the past four hours of magneto hydrodynamic pressure modeled by the Space Weather Modeling Framework. And things are calm as far as space weather goes. So that's what's going on to about 12 Earth diameters. Here's what's going on on the ground level, ground magnetic perturbations map. It's our geospace ground magnetic perturbations, depicting magnetic flux density, also modeled by the Space Weather Modeling Framework. The past four hours of magnetic flux. KP index at 0 0.67. Again, it is calm as far as geomagnetism. Next, looking at solar wind data here from ACE. Very diffuse and quite slow there. Only one proton per cubic centimeter and 3.83. I mean, 3.83. 383 kilometers per second for the solar wind velocity from ACE, from Discover. A lot faster and a lot denser. So solar wind density there from Discover, more like five and a half protons per cubic centimeter solar wind density at this uh, solar wind velocity at Discover. 460 kilometers per second, so a little elevated there at the Discover. A great example of differences in two spacecraft that are close to each other, both orbiting Lagrangian point one, about a million miles toward the Sun in between Earth and Sun. 392 at the ACE, 460 at the Discover. GOES magnetometers are smooth here in a fairly normal operating range. We're actually seeing slightly lower highs and higher lows for the past couple of days. Next is our top view ecliptic plane field plot. What's going on with Earth's magnetic sector in the heliosphere? Earth is still in a North Pole sector, but it looks like a South Pole sector is now imminent. All right, some indecision happening over there in the east once again. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Make sure you tune in tomorrow's Daily Space Weather Show to see the next. Anyway, here's our line of sight field plot. Solar B field in blue, polar fields in green and red for north and south respectively, photosphere magnetism in grayscale. Here's our line of sight coronal hole plot. Yeah, we've got magnetic indecision happening now in the northeast. So that's like a miniature Terminator event once again, folks. You'll see right up here, you're going to see the polarity of these coronal holes changing. That is an indication that there is some chaos happening right there. I'll just keep it simple and say that. And let's move to coronal holes from SDO. So there's a 24-hour video from SDO. Here's a little closer view of coronal holes. And it's, it seems like a good time to quote Richard Hammond of Top Gear. Please stop referring to me as a gaping gash. Moving right along to sunspots. Again, we've seen a modest uptick since yesterday. Sunspot number now up to about 129. 129 sunspots is the current situation. Flare probability monitor and scoreboard needs updating because we do have a high likelihood of large solar flares down here in the southeast. Also in the northeast, we have a, a rising likelihood of solar flares because there's another active region, likely a sunspot, rising up there as well. Plus, we've got sunspot 3536, the largest flare producing sunspot of solar cycle 25, moving right into the Earth facing zone by tomorrow's Daily Space Weather video. Solar flare watch continues here in multiple spots. Flare watch is for sunspot 3534, 3536, these groups, and these groups. 
So multiple places where we could see large solar flares at the moment. Let's take a look at the SDO continuum to look at sunspots in detail. There you go, another 24-hour video for you. And there is a new sunspot that's formed up here as well, right up there, another new, small, modest, little alpha-class-looking sunspot there. And before we get to solar energetic particles and flares, there is nothing before we get to solar energetic particles and flares. Ghost proton flux is now subsiding, following another little modest peak right around midnight, associated with that CME that popped off. So a great example of how you can see uh, relativistic particles arriving without a major solar flare. So we have the D layer now calming down, though. You see at the end here, the polar radio blackouts are subsiding. So just in the past few hours there, radio communications are largely coming back even in the polar regions. So there you go. There's the X-ray flux for the past three days. It's now back up to a background flux of about C1.2, a C1, I'll say. So a little bit of a rise in the X-ray flux, probably caused by those groups in the southeastern limb. And here's a great view of those. All of the active regions there in that 94 Angstrom's 24-hour video And before we look at that group in the southeast, here is sunspot 3536, which certainly does still harbor some complex magnetic fields. It does still have the capability of producing a large solar flare. But if I had to guess, I would say the most likely place for a major flare is down there in the southeast. I was watching some plasma instability happening throughout the day today. All it takes is a major plasma filament to move around sufficiently, and that could be the physical mechanism that actually causes a solar flare. That's the past 24 hours from Solar Dynamics Observatory. Next, a star chart. That's what's going on overhead Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Just press the Now button once you've put in your location at skyandtelescope.org to create your own. And Capricorn is just setting on the western horizon. Next, our solar system forecast. This is where things are today on January 5th. That's where they'll be in one week on the 12th as Earth makes its way onto the lonely side of the solar system, the gas giant free side of the solar system. And in one week, we will have a new moon. Next, the astronomy photo of the day is the trapezium part of the Orion Nebula, and those stars in that nebula are moving at a very high rate of speed. Now, they're located only at about 1,500 light years of distance, and their extreme motion is blamed on a black hole. It could be the closest black hole if it indeed is an object like that. Now, of course, I have been calling these a massive radio source since about 1995 or so, so just be aware of that. Uh, I'm not going to get into the debate about whether black holes are a thing or not. I'll just say there is a massive radio source in the trapezium. There are stars moving at extreme velocities. So, yeah, the trapezium, apod.nasa.gov if you want to check it out yourself. Some gas illuminated by some bright stars. Next, coronal mass ejections. So right at the beginning of this 62 frames, you will see an ejection popping off of there, coming out of the east. And if you're wondering if it's earthly directed, well, the answer is, I don't think so. So here we've added C3. Let's get a little closer here. There is the closer zoomed in view from the Integrated Space Weather Analysis Center. So one CME coming out of the southeast just before midnight and then a second one kind of coming out of the east-southeast. I don't think either of those have earthly directed components. Let us know what you think in the comments. We do read all viewer comments even if we are unable to respond to each one. 
So here come our custom coronagraphs and the SDO imagery synchronized. That's pretty sweet. A 24 hour video for you there. Here we've zoomed in a little bit closer. You'll be able to see that plasma filament erupt right at the beginning. And there it goes. And sadly, this time I can't say here it comes. Sorry, Aurora chasers. It doesn't look like there's any new space weather on the way. So there's a great view here. We've dropped the C3 and added 304 angstrom 60 minute running difference to the 193 angstroms SDO imagery showing fantastic contrast in that filamentary action there associated with sunspot 3536. What's that? It wasn't close enough for you. Okay. There's a little closer view. Pretty sweet. And here's an even closer view. All right. Does that cover it? I think that's I think that's sufficient. Great view of those new rising sunspots down there in the southeast as well. What's that? You want more space weather? Okay, well, let's take a look at solar filaments, since they're known to turn into coronal mass ejections. There you go. There's Cerro Tololo, Chile. And several filaments that could be named there. Follow us over on Twitter, x.com slash smashomash. Just follow the hashtag name that filament to see all of our named filaments for the past couple of years, year and a half maybe, something like a year, something like that. We've been naming filaments for a while. And there is the colored imagery. Just awesome frames there from Cerro Tololo, Chile, part of the National Solar Observatory. And before we get the bonus features here, the past couple of hours from the GO-16, Good times. Great views. And let's get the bonus features. Bonus features. Here they come. Satellite charging hazards are non-existent. It's smooth sailing at the moment. So yeah, no internal or surface charging hazards for satellites. Goes electron flux here in a normal range, kind of on the low side. That's the past three days. There's the one year chart of the electron flux. Kind of a little bit of a low electron flux here for the past week or so. Uh, I would expect an uptick based on sti based, uh, base, base statistical probability of an uptick. And Noah does agree. It's look looking like it's going to be modest here according to Noah. No arguments from me there. Next we'll show the layer where it's measured. The GOES-16 and the GOES-18, they're high above the ionosphere. In the outer portion, in the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt, they use radiography to measure the electron flux at that layer, the F layer. So that is where the electron flux is measured. And here is Australia Government Bureau of Meteorology, Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology's uh, ionogram, ionosond, as it's known. And nope, no apocalypse to be forecasted by the ionosphere. If you're looking for reasons to hide in your bunker, that is not a reason. Here's the anomaly in megahertz from a 30 day medium. No, this doesn't give you any good reason to go hide in your bunker. Not spooky. And before we close out a couple more segments of space weather, here's the WAM, the whole atmosphere model, the global ionosphere now cast. Total electron content on the left, maximum usable radio frequency on the right. A great snapshot of what's going on. It shows day and night transitions. It shows the anomaly for both. And the last portion of our space weather coverage is the high res images. So here's 3536. 
It's still quite magnetically complex. It's still what I would call a beta gamma class at the very least. Is it beta gamma delta? Well, let's take a look. Yep, it's beta gamma delta class, but just barely. So it's not, not as active looking as it was. This group down here, that is beta class. It's a little bit too early to look. I'm not going to try to classify that one. And this new sunspot about to rise over here, way too early for that. Let's just show the full disk. And let's move on to meteorology. Congratulations for tuning into the Smash News Network, least busted name in news, where we show you the space weather and the earth weather and hold the propaganda and nonsense. Now we're looking at this low pressure. And it's not that low, comparatively speaking. I mean, it's not, it's not that low as far as real pressure goes. But comparatively speaking, it is quite low compared to the surrounding air. So it's, uh, yeah, about 1,000 hectopascals here at the moment. Uh, but that's enough in the wintertime to produce some major action. So that is the mean sea level pressure. And again, it's not really that low, because check out this low over here. 962 hectopascals over there, so much lower. And the Southern Ocean's looking a lot stormier than it had been as well. So that is the lowest pressure on Earth once again there, south of the Aleutian Islands. And let's get to our regularly scheduled meteorology segment. And of course, meteorology will be an important topic in the coming days as the Northeast is going to get kaplastered with snow. Anyway, there are the surface winds of the east, there are the jet streams of the east, jet streams of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, surface winds of the central world, surface winds of the west, and the jet streams of the Americas. Next, clouds and fog for the Americas. We like to use the shortwave radiation map when it's too dark for the visible satellite. That's what's going on. And let's take a look at this low that's now making its way across Louisiana into Mississippi. So there's a fantastic view of that. And that is what will be bringing the snow to my doorstep. Moving right along to our windy.com map. There are the next three days of new snow according to the Euro model. So quite a lot of snow here coming to the US. And there is the GFS model for the next three days of new snow. So I'll rock it back here once again, the Euro model for the next three days of new snow. There's the GFS model. Here's our weather.gov map, and check it out. Lots of weather warnings here, mostly of the wintry variety. Also a bunch of gale warnings there on the East Coast. So there's the key. Weather.gov is where to get your weather warnings. If your location is lit on the map, head to weather.gov, the homepage of the National Weather Service, and click your location. Here come some forecasts. First, the GFS 72-hour pressure and precipitation. Ta-da! Heavy storms showing up at Louisiana as forecast. 72 hour, oh, and by the way, press the like button or else tell your friends and foes about the channel, press share, press comment, etc. 72 hour GFS accumulated positive snow depth change in inches. That's quite a bit of snow. The US is going to gain some surface mass in the coming three days. DAG! Next, temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius, the GFS 72 hour model once again. Some very hot temperatures coming to Texas, where it'll be as much as 16 degrees Celsius above normal in a couple of days. DAG! Oh my god! 
although not very cold, in the northeast. Next, the that's the mean surface level. That's the mean uh, the mean sea level pressure along with surface winds. That's what it is. And as that nor'easter makes its way up to the east coast, it's going to become a major pressure gradient there off the coast of Cape Cod. So that's really going to kick up some high seas there just off the coast of New England. 72-hour GFS mean sea level pressure and surface wind forecast. And finally, the culprit. So you see this huge kink in the jet stream bringing cold air all the way down to Texas and beyond. Seventy-two hour, two hundred fifty millibar wind forecast. That is the jet stream. Check it out. We had some major lightning in the Gulf. Narlands had some major lightning, but mainly in the Gulf. Let's see if we have any current strikes according to lightningmaps.org. Off the coast of Pensacola and Mobile. Also Gulf Shores. Perhaps some good surf being kicked up there in the Gulf of Mexico. Let us know in the comments if you have surfed the Gulf. An area which requires high seas, like Bermuda, to have good surf. We'll close out the daily space weather video with the latest U.S. Doppler radar. There's a close-up of all that moisture making its way all the way across the U.S. It is part of the Pacific moisture belt. Anyway, there's the full 50-state view briefly. We're focusing on the lower 48 view for the rest of this video. There's clouds and fog, and there is water vapor. And once again, we've got a great example here. You've got an impulse of this dry mass of air pushing this along. This is a relative high pressure zone. The low is kind of right here right now. So huge pressure gradients being created there on the back end of that. And uh, yeah, that's what's going on. Here's a recap. Vertical motion in the air column from ground-based Doppler radar systems. Infrared radiation from space-based systems showing clouds and fog even at nighttime. Shortwave radiation. Space-based systems showing water vapor, as in all of it dry air and moist air and hopefully the weather has not dried you out or the ridiculous forecasts have not made you too moistened anyway see you soon once again congratulations on realizing the channel exists i've been your host dan aka smash o mash signing off and may that solar wind be at your back